All right, so uh, this is the last talk for the day. Hopefully you're still surviving. Uh, ben is from Cray. He is the lead developer of the Cray AI libraries. Uh, he's done a ton of work in developing these libraries and he's gonna tell us about hyperparameter optimization. Thank you. All right, so we're gonna dive right into hyperparameter optimization. Um, I'm gonna start with some background just to get all of us on the same page. Um, this, this is a uh, relatively simple or maybe elementary compared to the stuff we've been uh, covering already, but just to make sure we're using the same semantics. So uh, what is a model parameter? A model parameter is our model parameters are values that are within a model and determined from the data itself. Um, so this is, the, this is the model parameters that you're training. Uh, so in a linear regression, this might be your, this would be your slope and intercept, M and B. Um, in a decision tree, this would be your, um, your splits in your tree that you're uh, making in order to optimize your model to um, predict some data. And uh, in neural networks, this is our weights and biases uh, that, we've, that we've been learning about this week. Um, so that transitions us over to model hyperparameters. Uh, so model hyperparameters are values that are external to the model, but that influence the model capacity. Um, I will elaborate a little bit more on, on what model capacity means in the next slide. Uh, but first, uh, so in linear regression, we don't really have any hyperparameters. It's a, uh, there's no knobs to turn in that, in that procedure. Um, in, in decision trees, we can think about uh, modifying our tree depth as a hyperparameter. This will uh, influence the model capacity. And in neural networks, um, we have many hyperparameters. We have learning rate, learning rate decay schedule, number of neurons, loss function, activation function, so on. Um, we've heard about a lot of this uh, throughout the week already. Okay, so what do I mean by model capacity? Um, it's, it's really a general term um, for capturing uh, how, how much we are overfitting or underfitting, uh, both things we want to minimize. Also our time to accuracy. Um, how, uh, how quickly we reach our desired accuracy, uh, our model trains to its desired accuracy. And related to that is efficiency, so the total CPU time uh, required to achieve that accuracy. Okay, um, and I just wanna acknowledge that uh, while we're talking about hyperparameter optimization here, that can actually mean quite a lot of things um, there's actually a full spectrum of hyperparameters. So um, on the far right here, uh, I've been kind of talking about training hyperparameters in our um, in the example so far. There's also spatial hyperparameters, which are um, which are uh, things like your in your neural networks, your uh, number of layers, or the size of your layers, or the connectivity. We also have feature selection, um, which can be thought of as a hyperparameter and model selection, which can be thought of as a hyperparameter. So uh, there's kind of a spectrum of types of hyperparameter optimization strategies, um, or classes rather. Um, down at this end, I, I consider this traditional hyperparameter optimization, while doing spatial uh, HPO is more of a neural architecture search. And when you're doing all of these things together, we consider this uh, an, an automated machine learning. Okay, so um, in uh, hyperparameters and deep learning, uh, there are a lot of hyperparameters to deal with. There's a lot of knobs to turn. And in fact, um, there was a really good quote from earlier this week um, from someone who spoke. They said, deep learning is a hyperparameter soup. Um, that was from Josh uh, in his talk. So I, I dedicated the slide to Josh. <laughs> Um, and it's true, there's a lot of hyperparameters to deal with in deep learning. Um, you know, on the training side, we have our optimizer learning rate momentum. Uh, I'm not gonna read all of these off, but and you've seen a lot of these throughout the week um, and probably have tried to tune some of these in your models yourselves. We also have a lot of spatial hyperparameters um, to modify as well. So uh, hyperparameter optimization in deep learning is a, uh, very high dimensional problem. 
Um, in addition to the high dimensionality and, high, and uh, deep learning hyperparameter optimization, there are a number of other challenges. So we have, uh, so we have the fact that hyperparameters can be continuous values or categorical or integer uh, values, which poses some uh, mathematical challenges. Um, computing gradients is, is pretty challenging to do. Um, it's still an open research question if we can do this in hyperparameter optimization, although there are, there are some interesting work that are being done. Um, and uh, some contributions to that are the fact that the cost function is non-deterministic and noisy, um, and the cost function can be discontinuous as well. Um, the hyperparameter space that we are searching is, uh, contains many uh, flat regions which produce similar models. Um, it can be very easy for an optimizer to get stuck in these regions. Um, the cost functions being minimized uh, only represent a sample of the performance as we are typically, um, we are typically optimizing our hyperparameters for only a subset of the data as we should. Um, evaluations are expensive. It's just the nature of deep learning. And evaluation times can vary greatly across hyperparameters, this, uh, depending on the choice of hyperparameters. You can, one obvious one is the number of epochs uh, we're using in our training. Okay, so um, that's a little bit of a background. Now I'm gonna jump right into uh, reviewing some hyperparameter optimization strategies. Um, and at a very high level, there's um, kind of two main strategies you can think about, uh, two main categories. We have manual HPO, or as I like to call it, graduate <laughs> student descent. <laughs> Um, so hyperparameters, uh, in this case, are selected and tuned manually, and, you know, this is okay for a lot of cases, and I'm sure a lot of you are doing this in, um, in, some, of you, in some of the handouts, um, and this is typically guided by intuition or rules of thumb. Um, it's okay in some, it's okay in limited cases, but when you really want to uh, find the optimal hyperparameters for your model, um, you want to move into the regime of automated HPO. Um, so here in automated HPO, we are tasked with the problem of searching this hyperparameter space, doing a brute force search. The entire search space is uh, an intractable problem, so we must utilize an algorithm that searches the subspace. So let's go over some of these algorithms that uh, try to divide and choose how to explore the subspace of hyperparameters. So um, I'm trying, I'll try to uh, present this as a number of different categories of hyperparameter optimization. So, um, so there is a class of uh, HPOs uh, called exhaustive search algorithms. This includes grid, random, and genetic. I'm gonna go through all of these more in depth. Um, there's also surrogate models, which um, really try to minimize the number of valuations uh, in order to reach the uh, minima. And there's also early stopping algorithms which exploit this fact in uh, hyperparameter, this property in hyperparameter optimization that um, you, can, you can approximate the value of a, um, you can approximate the value of a set of hyperparameters before the, uh, before the training is completed. And there's also gradient-based algorithms. I'm not really gonna say much about those, but I just wanna acknowledge that they exist. And uh, I really think the research being done there is exciting. Okay, so to start, um, we have grid search. <clears throat> so grid search, uh, as, you, as you can probably uh, infer from the name, is simply discretizing the hyperparameter space into Cartesian coordinates to evaluate. Um, uh, this is a naturally an embarrassingly parallel problem. Um, however, it suffers from the curse of dimensionality. Uh, the number of points that you evaluate grow exponentially with respect to the number of hyperparameters. Um, as we discussed in deep learning, we have a large number of hyperparameters. So you're going, if you were going to employ grid search to deep learning, you would really have to limit the number of hyperparameters you would want to search at, the, at a time. Um, if, you do, if you do end up using grid search, you want to uh, probably apply it in an iterative fashion uh, known as multi-resolution grid search, where say, um, say in this example, we found that, uh, I don't know, this, this, point did, this point did reasonably well, so maybe we would do 
a finer mesh of grid points around this point. Okay, the next, uh, the next strategy to discuss is random search. Uh, so random search is, as the name implies, randomly sampling hyperparameters from, a, uh, from the hyperparameter space. Um, it's embarrassingly parallel as well. And uh, it exploits the fact that some hyperparameters uh, matter more than others. Um, this, is, this is an observation made in this famous paper by Bergstra and, uh, I don't know how you pronounce his name, Bingio. Um, back in 2012, and pretty much every place you read on the internet that suggests uh, that suggests using random search uh, cites this paper as the, as the uh, main motivation. Um, and this is a famous figure from that paper um, showing how grid search fails to um, fails to explore the uh, hyperparameter space uh, where one hyperparameter matters much more than the other. Um, whereas random search is much more successful with a fewer number of evaluations. Um, and uh, in the HPO uh, re research, you can see a lot of uh, researchers uh, reference random search as frustratingly successful because it's kind of like the dumbest strategy you could possibly think of, but it's ridiculously good uh, for, for how dumb it is. Um, but we've, we've come a long ways uh, or we've come some ways from random search since then. Okay, the next strategy I want to talk about is genetic HPO. So um, I'd like you to think of genetic algorithms applied to HPO as an automatic, iterative, stochastic grid search with pruning. Um, and what that's really getting you is kind of uh, uh, the best of both worlds between random search and grid search um, with with uh, benefiting from previous iter the knowledge learned in previous iterations. Um, so genetic algorithms in general excel at optimizing many parameters of varying importance, uh, a property that we have of the uh, random search. Um, genetic, genetic HPO is inspired by biological systems found in nature. Um, the three key features are mutation, crossover, and selection. So I'll walk you through how these are applied in genetic HPO. So, um, so we start with a founder hyperparameter in this uh, strategy. Um, so we'll create an uh, initial population around uh, the default hyperparameters by mutating that founder. Um, so you have a set of um, initial, you have a set of initial randomized hyperparameters around that founder. We'll then um, evaluate each of those uh, individuals in that population and get each of those neural networks accuracy. Um, and then from that accuracy, we're going to calculate the relative, uh, the relative performance of each individual, and that would be the um, individual's fitness. And so based on the fitness, we're going to um, do a weighted sampling and choose pairs of parents to uh, that were successful to pass on their uh, hyperparameters to the next to the next generation, and we create a we create a child uh, from those parents with crossover and mutation. Crossover being uh, we take only some hyperparameters from one parent, others from another parent, and mutation being um, we perturb some of those hyperparameters that we inherit from the uh, parent. And then we kill the old population uh, and the, ch the next generation grows up. Um, so this is very inspired by uh, evolution and biology. And um, it, it is, strikes a nice balance between the uh, exploration and exploitation and the explore exploit uh, problem. Um, genetic HPO is also embarrassingly parallel. Um, per generation as you need to have some, there is some sequential dependency uh, across generations. Um, and uh, again, the biggest advantage is that each generation benefits from the data uh, of the previous generation. So the data, are, the, the work you're doing uh, continues to uh, benefit the next generation. So here's, here's a nice figure from uh, this paper uh, applying large scale uh, genetic HPOs on image classifiers. And uh, what's important to note here is that uh, this is the this is the populate 
these are populations over time, and you see that their accuracy rapidly jumps, and then they slowly approach, they slowly converge to this high accuracy. Um, if we were doing a random or grid search, you might imagine a lot more of this empty space here would be filled. Um, but because the genetic HPO is learning from previous generations, we are doing a much uh, smarter search here. Okay, the natural, <clears throat> the natural transition uh, from genetic HPOs is into population-based training. So population-based training is also a genetic-based approach. Um, and this, this approach trains its hyperparameters uh, during the model optimization. So this is an early stopping uh, algorithm that I talked about earlier. Um, so uh, the process here goes as follows. Uh, we select a random set of hyperparameters and train multiple models in parallel. And then every n epochs, we do the following. We take the best model and hyperparameters and copy over the, uh, copy those over the worst models. Um, so the worst models uh, you can think of as the um, low performing individuals in a population that are dying off in that generation. And then if a model was copied over, we randomly perturb those hyperparameters. So that's kind of, that's the mutation we saw in the genetic hyperparameter optimization. Um, and so this is a figure from um, uh, Google DeepMind, their uh, original blog post on this, uh, which was late 2017, I believe. Um, so you can see here we have two, we have uh, two mo models and sets of hyperparameters being trained. Um, this one does better. You can see in the performance here, this one does better than this one. So we're going to exploit that fact and copy these hyperparameters over here. And then we are doing an exploration with this one that was copied over and perturbing the hyperparameters uh, where, while we leave these alone. And these continue uh, and at a later time, you see that the exploration ended up doing better than the original parent. So um, population-based training, um, uh, another advantage of it is it produces a reusable, uh, because it's doing early stopping, it produces a reusable hyperparameter schedule um, because it's perturbing the hyperparameters during training. So you can kind of get a best set of hyperparameters per epoch or per whatever your interval is, and then use that at a later time to, um, to uh, reach accuracy, reduce your time to accuracy. Um, and then this is a nice figure from their, uh, their paper or blog post um, where they visualize, they visualize the population-based training. Um, so the X and Y axes are actually kind of meaningless on this figure. What's, in, what's important is uh, the color, and the darker blue, or the, yeah, the more blue is the better performing, um, and the black is poorly performing. And you can see that, um, you can see that the blue, the bluer um, sets of hyperparameters tend to get explored quicker, and the black ones die off quickly. Okay, um, jumping over to Bayesian HPO, um, yes. Um, I, th I think this was two separate, uh, let's see here. If I recall correctly, I think this was just two separate uh, models they were looking at. So you, the easiest way to think about this is learning rate. It's pretty common for us to, uh, to train a learning rate schedule. And in fact, a lot of these optimizers try to find, a lot of like Atom optimizer tries to find that learning rate schedule. Um, so um, that's, that's exactly what's happening here. Uh, yes, so you could use this to replace, so you could use this to replace, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, uh, sorry, so you wouldn't use a learning rate schedule with one of those optimizers. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I know that number off the top of my head, but it's a pretty big, they did a pretty big uh, experiment here. Yeah, um, you can check, you can check out this, uh, this source or just if you Google population-based training or DeepMind PBT, this will be like your first hit. <clears throat> um, jumping over to uh, Bayesian HPO. So I always like um, describing Bayesian optimization with um, pictures and figures rather than math, because um, it's easy for your eyes to glaze over when you see all of the, uh, the Bayesian math. 
Um, so the intuitive way to, to think about Bayesian optimization, at least for me, um, is uh, if you look at the following figure, um, what number would you choose? Uh, what number would, so say so you have this, this uh, data of random forest results with different number of trees, um, and you are assigned with choosing the next point to evaluate uh, to find the minimal error. What area would you choose on the graph or on the plot? Um, and you would probably choose somewhere down here because we're already doing pretty well uh, down in this area. And that's exactly what uh, Bayesian optimiz optimizers are doing. So um, formal definition of a Bayesian optimizer is that it's a sequential um, model-based optimization that's building a surrogate model for the objective. Um, and it quantifies the uncertainty in that sur surrogate model using a Gaussian, uh, Gaussian process regression. Uh, lots of caveats here. There's tons of, um, there's tons of variations in this, but I'm just uh, describing the most popular approach. Um, so here's kind of, here's a, a nice way to visualize this. We've collected a few data points along this X axis. We have some values. And so the uh, Gaussian process um, regression uh, shows the expected value between those values as well as an uncertainty. And so this, uh, this figure here, um, this Gaussian process regression is then mapped onto an acquisition function, which uh, is defined, so it's defined by that surrogate model. And then that, we, we take the maximum value in that acquisition function to determine the next point we're going to evaluate, um, which was somewhere around 200 over here. Um, and so effectively, Bayesian optimization is minimizing the number of evaluations required to explore, give, to explore a given space or find the minimum in a given space. Um, so uh, some properties of Bayesian optimizations, uh, Bayesian HPOs is that they are um, um, ideal for optimizing object, objective functions with very expensive evaluations, um, which is true for a lot of deep learning models. However, they are best suited for a small number of hyperparameters. Um, they've been shown to be uh, relatively ineffective with more than 20 hyperparameters. That's good to be aware of if you are employing one of these strategies. Um, they are tolerant of stochastic noise in function evaluations, another property of deep learning. Um, and unfortunately, they are highly sequential, uh, making parallelization difficult. Um, but there are some parallel strategies that do exist. Um, it's also worth noting that, uh, so along the way during the Bayesian HPO, we have an inversion of the covariance matrix, which becomes a, co a computational bottleneck at some point. Um, uh, so this, is, this grows uh, cubically with the number of uh, evaluations you've done. So this, this could impact you if you do a large number of evaluations with, uh, with a Bayesian HPO. Um, but some efficient approximations exist to work around this. Um, it's just good to be aware of if you're employing one of these. Okay, the next strategy I'd like to talk about is hyperband. So um, now we're getting into some of the more recent developments in hyperparameter optimization. Um, and it's not too long ago that Bayesian, I guess it still is, Bayesian approaches and HPO is kind of like the craze right now. Um, but in a lot of these um, build on top of Bayesian HPO. Okay, so, um, so hyperband is a successive halving algorithm uh, that's combined with random search. Um, so the process of, uh, the process, um, of hyperband goes as follows. So um, you sample a K sets of hyperparameters, um, you evaluate them for N epochs, and then you discard the lowest performing half of hyperparameters, um, and then you continue evaluating in, in uh, continue evaluating the remaining hyperparameters for n more epochs. Um, and then you discard the lower performing half again, and uh, you run the good ones for even more epochs. And this is kind of visualized here. Um, so this is, this again is an early stopping algorithm um, that's finding a nice balance between the explore exploit problem. So we start with a bunch of sets of hyperparameters um, that are sorted by their performance. Um, after they're evaluated to some, some level, and then um, we only continue training a certain number of them, and then 
we keep chopping that off until only one remains. Um, so as you can imagine, that process is pretty hard to parallelize. So the extension to that is the asynchronous success of having algorithm, which is also, uh, which is also part of hyperbrand. So this is the parallel friendly extension of hyperbrand. Um, this, uh, this works by assigning workers to evaluate hyperparameters ranked at the bottom rung. Um, and then when a, when a worker finishes their evaluation, they request more work. Um, if a set of hyperparameters qualifies for promotion to the next rung, it is chosen. Um, otherwise, the worker start, starts with a new set of hyperparameters at the bottom rung again. Um, so this gives workers something to do um, this gives workers something to do if their set of hyperparameters didn't work out. Um, and you can see here, uh, the resource efficiency is much, much nicer. Actually, when we go to the next slide, you can compare these side and side. Um, so up here we have the synchronous success of having, uh, I believe this, uh, so I don't recall the year this algorithm was developed, but this is the more recent asynchronous success of has, having from, I think, 2018. Um, where we now have a parallel strategy for, um, for doing hyperband. Okay, uh, the next strategy is Bayesian optimization and hyperband. Uh, so getting really creative with the names, we're just combining two things. Um, so that's BOHB. Um, so this, so BOHB um, essentially is a hyperband, except um, instead of using um, random search to sample the hyperparameters is using a Bayesian optimizer to sample the hyperparameters. Um, so this is a, a pretty big improvement. Um, it also supports a parallel formulation, as you can imagine. And uh, this is from their uh, paper, uh, which they did a blog post about. Um, and they, they show some pretty nice uh, speed ups, uh, speed ups over some other, uh, so they compare it to random search. Bayesian optimization, hyperband, and then BOHB. Um, so BOHB and hyperband are kind of neck and neck early on, but as, uh, as the number of epochs continues, um, BOHB tends to outperform uh, hyperband as well. Um, with the caveat of this is a specific, uh, specific model they were looking at. I don't think this, I don't, I don't think this was, uh, this is yet a generalizable trend, but it's, uh, it looks pretty promising. Okay, some other strategies that I'm not gonna go into in depth, uh, but just wanna expose you to. There's tree structured Parson estimators, TPE. Um, these are uh, Bayesian approaches, uh, to, uh, that utilize categorical hyperparameters and tree structure, such as the connectivity between layers, uh, depending on the number of layers. Um, <clears throat> there's, this, uh, there's this algorithm with a pretty cool name, um, Fast Bayesian Optimization on Large Data Sets, or Fabulous, like Fabulous, I guess, um, from Klein et al. in 2016. Um, so this is an um, approach that this is an Bayesian approach as well that um, operates on only a small fraction of the, da the data set at a time. Um, so it exploits the fact that we can uh, optimize our hyperparameters on just a small, a very small subsample of the total um, data. And it uses a tunable parameter to uh, determine that fraction of data to use uh, throughout training. And then lastly, uh, I just want to give a shout out to my gradient-based HPOs. Uh, there's a lot of active research going on out there. So um, it's, I just wanted to mention the work being done there. Okay, uh, so now I wanna talk about um, some, give an overview of some different HPO software um, out in the wild. So um, I am the developer on the Cray AI HPO framework, um, but I didn't think it'd be fair to just present on Cray AI HPO since that would be kind of a biased opinion. So I'm going to give a, uh, kind of gentle overview of some of this HPO software out there, and then we're gonna dive into looking at Cray AI HPO. Okay, so um, some of the traditional HPO softwares out there, these are, these are HPO libraries that provide a number of strategies. Um, so we have HyperOpt, 
uh, which supports random and TPE, tree parson estimators that I mentioned. Um, it's kind of nice because it supports distributed HPO with MongoDB. Um, unfortunately, uh, as uh, Steve was pointing out when we were discussing this earlier, uh, development on this project has kind of fallen off, but it does seem that there are some people still supporting it. Um, HPO lib2 as part of the auto ML suite. Uh, so this provides a common interface to a uh, couple different standalone packages that implement some algorithms, SMACS, BeerMint, HyperBand, and DOHB. Um, it, unfortunately, it looks like HBO lib is uh, not, not receiving a lot of attention either, but it, it, does, uh, it, does, it is pretty um, uh, useful as is, I would say. Um, then there's Advisor, which contains a ton of HPO algorithms, which uh, can be nice to just try out some different things. Um, and uh, lastly on this list is Cray AI HBO, the uh, framework that I've, I'm working on at Cray. Um, so this is a distributed uh, hyperparameter optimization for H intended for HPC users, although you can run it on your um, local machine as well. Um, currently we have grid, random, and genetic and PBT, uh, and we are uh, currently in the process of uh, developing a Bayesian optimizer. Um, and I put that it's being actively developed because um, like I mentioned for a couple of these, uh, all, all three of these uh, aren't really receiving a lot of active uh, uh, development support right now. Uh, we have some general trends. I'm going to talk about some general general trends and practical tips kind of at the end of this section. And then, and then if I don't answer your question, then I'm gonna ask again. Okay, um, then there's a few single algorithm HPO softwares I wanted to point out. So we have Spearmint, which uh, has some Bayesian optimizers, uh, SMAC3, which is a Bayesian-based uh, SMAC algorithm. Um, uh, we have this HP Bandster, which implements Hyperband and BOHB. I believe that's the implementation from the uh, the publication. And then Hypergrad is one of the gradient-based uh, HPOs, um, which has a uh, memory usage trade-off for uh, storing uh, stochastic gradient descent intermediate results. This is kind of just a research toy at this point, but um, it will be cool to see that mature. Um, just for completeness, I want to mention that there are some platform-specific HPOs softwares out there for all the different uh, cloud providers or all the big big names at least. So we have an, there's an AWS AutoML framework. Um, SageMaker has an HPO suite. Uh, Azure ML has an HPO suite, and Google Cloud does as well. Um, and then, if you if you recall from the the Spectrum slide, uh, there's there on the far left. Uh, we have some frameworks that um, deal with optimizing not only your traditional hyperparameters, but also your topology, your features, and your the choice of models. So that's um, this is a few examples of those um, frameworks. So Auto Auto ML is a is a pretty big framework uh, which has a lot of which tries to unify a common interface to a ton of underlying algorithms. Um, TPOT is another uh, AutoML workflow that utilizes genetic programming. And there's um, H2O AI, which, uh, or it's H2O by H2O AI, um, that supports population-based training. Uh, notably, I think, I think they're the only other uh, main HPO package that supports PBT right now. Um, and they also support distributed training. And then lastly, I just want to mention there's some there are some Keras uh, integrated HPO softwares. So um, so there's Hyperos, which is a hyperopt wrapper for Keras. There's Talos, which um, has uh, grid, random, and probabilistic successive having algorithms. Um, and then lastly, there's Keras Tuner, which you heard Josh Josh mention. Um, I believe this is of these three, this is the one receiving the most active. Uh, uh, development right now. Um, and currently this supports random and hyperband. Um, and uh, we'll see what we'll see what they have in store. Looks like an exciting project. Okay, uh, so next I want to transition over to talking about some um, some just general practical tips in hyperparameter optimization. Now that you have an overview of 
the available algorithms, the available uh, software out there. Okay, so um, like I mentioned before, deep learning uh, in general uh, has long evaluations. So the, the HPO process is going to take uh, a long time. Expect HPO uh, runs to take anywhere from hours to weeks, um, depending on how large your training takes. Um, so, so choosing the wrong search space for your algorithm uh, can have large consequences. It's, it's worth taking the time to plan your experiment um, for how you're going to search your hyperparameter space and what hyperparameters to use. Um, and it's, it's worth mentioning a lot of frameworks allow you to save results as you progress. That's also nice if you have, say, a node goes down or some, some software bug happens while you're running HPO. Um, it's good to have store intermediate results that you can recover from. Um, if you have distributed uh, resources available to you, uh, you should definitely utilize some kind of distributed HPO resource or distributed HPO software package. Uh, there's no reason not to with so many of these uh, HPO algorithms being embarrassingly parallel. Um, as mentioned in, uh, I believe it was Brenda's talk, um, you should use a development data partition out of your validation set uh, to, um, to train your hyperparameters. Um, this is just a, a good practice to make sure you're not overfitting uh, to your validation set. Um, and then it's also important to remember we're not trying to find the glo global minimum um, with, without some kind of cross-validation baked into your, uh, your performance of your hyperparameters, you're definitely going to overfit if you uh, optimize too much. So you either need to um, bake in some kind of cross-validation or, um, or just be careful about optimizing too much. Okay, on choosing hyperparameters. So, um, so for uh, choosing hyperparameters, you wanna utilize your domain knowledge about the model to focus on important hyperparameters. Um, it's important to start with uh, initial learning rate the um, next good candidate is to jump to learning rate decay schedule, such as uh, decay constant. And then uh, lastly, uh, regular, regularization strength, such as L2 penalty or dropout strength is a, is a, a third candidate to consider there. Um, also mentioned earlier this week, um, be careful about the pairing of um, incompatible loss functions and activation functions. Uh, loss functions and activation functions uh, with, without an, a paired exponential log um, can, can be wasted uh, evaluations. And um, also limit your search space. So uh, starting from a coarse grain search is reasonable, a reasonable approach. You can kind of do a hierarchical approach. Um, you, want to, uh, you want to use a log scale for multiplicative hyperparameters such as um, such as learning rate or momentum um, or regular, like regularization strength. Um, something like dropout rate, you would want just an absolute scale. All right, um, some tips on choosing a HBO strategy. Uh, grid search is bad, don't use it. Um, you should never really use it other than to benchmark against it. Um, but if you do use it, um, maybe you're using it because you don't wanna learn an HBO framework and you just wanna implement something manually. Um, that's okay for preliminary searches maybe, but you really don't want to use uh, grid search in general. Random search, uh, as I mentioned, has been um, very successful in the field. It's a really good option for getting started with HPO. Even if you don't wanna learn some HPO package out there, it's really easy to implement yourself. Um, and, and if you do end up learning an HPO package, it's supported by most packages out there. Um, and it's still competitive with a lot of modern uh, approaches within certain regimes. And then um, lastly, you, you really, uh, at some point you wanna graduate to using some of the more modern HPO strategies that have been developed in the past few years, uh, such as HyperOpt, BOHB, and PBT. Um, 
this is going to be especially important for large workloads where um, where your HPO runs for um, you know days to weeks. Um, and I also want to mention that it's not uncommon to uh, mix and match uh, HPO strategies. So as I said earlier, you can do a hierarchical search. Um, in doing something like that, it's, it's perfectly reasonable to start with, say, a random or genetic search for a broad search that's including your topology, um, and then switch over to a Bayesian search when you, uh, have, when you lock in some initial hyperparameters and only want to tune a smaller number of hyperparameters because Bayesian Bayesian optimizers do better with smaller uh, number of hyperparameters. Um, and then uh, things like PBT and hyperops, because they have that early stopping mechanism, uh, they cannot be used for topology search. So once you have your topology locked in, um, it can make sense to switch over to using PBT or hyperopt um, to uh, acquire a, a reusable learning schedule. So that were that was uh, just kind of throwing a lot of oh yeah question yeah so um, so if you're storing some kind of intermediate result you should be able to kind of look over your data and see um, or kind of plot your data is a really good way to to kind of visualize how how different hyperparameters impacted uh, the accuracy that's a really good point. Um, and I, I didn't want to just leave it off there. This, uh, you know, the best practice for hyperparameter parameter optimization is really uh, still kind of an open research question. Uh, and there's lots of people working on it. And so um, I just wanted to point to a couple resources, um, some of which uh, contributed a lot to this, to the tips here. But if you want to look more into it, what are some of the more recent um, practices, these are a couple of good uh, resources to check out. Okay, so with that, I'm going to transition over to talking about Cray AI HPO. So this is Cray's, um, this is Cray's hyperparameter optimization framework. So uh, I call it an emerging hyperparameter optimization framework because um, it's still under active development. We're not 1.0 yet. Um, so we, we consider ourselves uh, alpha release right now, and we are we are reserving the right to make breaking changes to the inter interface, which is actually happening right now. Um, it's portable, so um, it could run on your desktop to uh, run on a supercomputer. Um, it's a light it has a lightweight black box interface, so um, it treats the it. It defines an interface to uh, just a, a executable on your uh, file system, and that can be anything you want it to be. So it can be uh, a Python file with a Python script using any of these machine learning toolkits, deep learning toolkits, um, or it can be uh, you know a, a Fortran program or something if you want to use it, if you're using Fortran in uh, deep learning or something. I don't know, there's DOE folks here. <laughs> okay, um, it's, so as I mentioned, it's distributed in HPC environments. So uh, it supports distribution out of the box. It's the mechanism it's using, it's just interfacing directly with the uh, workload manager on the machine. Um, and it supports two different types of distribution. So we can do distributed HPO where we're evaluating, um, we're evaluating multiple sets of hyperparameters simultaneously we also support distributed model training where say you have an allocation of uh, 64 nodes and say each evaluation, um, say you're using the distributed TensorFlow uh, uh, package, um, then each, each evaluation could be running on 16 nodes within, that, within those 64 nodes. Um, so there's kind of two, there's two different types of dis distribution that can be used uh, simultaneously. Um, and then uh, an important feature is that we've tried to design the, the low-level interface, which hasn't really been exposed to the public yet, but we plan to. Um, the low-level interface uh, it tries to be fairly uh, simple and generic to support uh, anyone, anyone coming along that wants to write their own strategy or anyone that's using this. 
can write their own strategy, um, say some new hyperparameter optimization paper um, comes out, they can go code it up and, and add, it, add it to the uh, framework. Um, so the backend is implemented in Chapel. Um, backend is implemented in Chapel, uh, which is, uh, I'll talk about that in a second. That's, a, that's my other part of my job. I work on the Chapel team at Cray. Um, and then the user-facing uh, interface is Python. So we're not forcing users to learn a new programming language to use this. So just a quick uh, blurb on Chapel. So Chapel is a modern, productive, parallel programming language. Um, it's open source, also scalable from laptops to clusters to supercomputers. Um, strives to be as performant as Fortran, as portable as C, as elegant as Python, um, and doing all of this uh, with dis in a distributed parallel um, setting. Um, create, so Cray AI projects uh, utilize Chapel uh, for a number of reasons, um, mostly to utilize their, the, uh, the modern language features of uh, shared built-in shared memory parallelism, uh, atom, built-in atomics in the language, uh, great interoperability with Python and uh, Fortran, and uh, just a lot of other great modern uh, programming language features like generics type inference, um, memory management strategies. Okay, so, um, so the, now I'm gonna walk you through the components of a Cray AI uh, HPO workflow. So this is if you're just starting from scratch, this is what you have to do. So there's two parts, there's the training kernel and there's the uh, HPO driver. So the training kernel um, is the model training program to be optimized. So this is what you're, this is what you're starting with. Um, so say you have a Jupyter notebook uh, from one of these handouts you have some, you have some uh, code in there that optimizes it, that uh, trains a neural network, and then prints out the accuracy. <clears throat> so that would be your model training program or your training kernel. Um, so the interface we define here is that you expose those hyperparameters through command line arguments. So in the Jupyter Notebook case, you would need to shift your code over into, once you have it, once you have it relatively uh, stable, you would, you would uh, put that into a Python, standalone Python script that you call, um, and you would maybe import arg parse and expose the hyperparameters. And then we also need to expose the figure of merit, or you can think of this as our cost function. This is the, this is the value to be um, minimized in our hyperparameter uh, optimization. Um, so this is just exposed through standard out with a unique identifier. Um, so, as I mentioned, your model training program can be written in anything. Uh, for example, it can be Python plus any of your favorite framework, R, Julia, um, whatever you want. <clears throat> okay, the second part is your HPO driver. So this is the, this is the program that actually imports the Cray AI module. Um, so this is, uh, this is a program that's being used to optimize the hyperparameters of the train kernel. Um, and this actually must be written in Python. So let's walk you through an example of this. All right. So say you say you start with a um, say you start with a Python script. Um, I kind of already went through this, but say you start with a Python script that you want to uh, use Cray AI HPO on. Um, so you would you would modify that Python script to expose the uh, hyperparameters and you would print the figure of merit. You would write your HBO driver um, and I'm gonna walk you through that now. Okay, so hopefully that's visible. It's kind of dark on here. Um, so the first step is to expose the hyperparameters. So we're doing this in this example, we're exposing our learning rate and our dropout, um, our dropout rate. Um, and then we're just utilizing those within a, uh, we're utilizing those uh, the flags we exposed within the script itself, rather than plugging in hard-coded values. And then we print out, uh, in this case, we're trying to minimize our loss value. So we print out our figure of merit identifiers, FOM. That's the default that you can set it to whatever you want. Um, so we print that out so that the optimizer can pick that up. Now jumping over to the driver code, 
Um, so first of all, note you can just import your Cray AI module. Um, we're using the HPO submodule. Um, so we're going to set up our evaluator. Our evaluator is um, our evaluator is how the framework knows how to evaluate a set of um, hyperparameters. So here it's just running the uh, the kernel script, which is so it's in the source directory. It's called train model pi. Then we're going to provide our hyperparameter flags. Um, so we expose the learning rate and dropout rate. So we plug those in here into this um, hyperparameter um, uh, list of lists. And so the structure goes as follows. You have a, um, the flag itself as a string, the default value, and then your bounds for the search space. And then you set up your hyperparameter optimizer. Um, here we're using the genetic optimizer. And then you uh, just call optimize on your parameters. And you can get your, your best figure of merit that was printed out and your best set of hyperparameters uh, from Python memory here. We also log a bunch of um, data along the way. OK, quick note about the params class. So this accepts a list of lists. Um, where each of those lists has the hyperparameter flag, default value in the search space, as I said. But uh, it's worth mentioning that these values can be integer, float, or string. Um, and the search space can be a tuple of bounds or a list of values. So here's just demonstrating all the possible, um, all the possible ways you could expo uh, expose or describe hyperparameter search space. Um, there's also the evaluator class. So the evaluator class um, is used to opt, is, um, as I already mentioned, it's, it's used to um, describe how to evaluate a set of hyperparameters. And this has a lot of uh, uh, bells and whistles here. Um, most importantly, there are some different types of launchers you can use. As I mentioned, we interface with the launcher uh, directly. So you could be using Slurm, PBS. Um, you could be using um, nothing if you're just running on your desktop or the uh, Eureka. Eureka uh, launcher. Um, the most, uh, the thing I want to point out here is that when you are running distributed, you just set your nodes equal to um, an amount, um, and Cray AI is uh, typically able to infer the workload manager you're using. So if you were on, uh, say, NERSC, and you set your nodes equal to four, um, it would uh, try to SLOC uh, four nodes for you and run run its evaluation on there. Alternatively, you could do a interactive SLOC, and once you're on there, you could run, you could set, tell your evaluator you want it to run with four nodes, and it would detect you're already on an allocation and run on that existing allocation. OK, so feature overview of HPO. Um, we have grid, random, genetic, and uh, Cray PBT. I'll talk a little bit about why that's called Cray PBT in a little bit. Um, and we have Bayesian on the way. So looking at the grid interface, um, we have, <clears throat> uh, so I already walked you through um, most of what the, most of uh, how this interface works, but just real quick. So we're, imp we're importing our submodule HPO, uh, setting up our evaluator that's gonna run some train.py that's, that's going to train our, uh, say our neural network. And he, emit a um, figure of merit. And then we have our list of hyperparameters um, with a default values and uh, search space. So here we just have an ABC that we're searching from negative 10 to 10, starting at zero. So you can use the grid optimizer, which you really shouldn't use it since we have better, uh, better algorithms available, but it's just kind of a benchmark. Um, and you can set your grid size um, to how much, so this is, how you'd like to chunk up each, um, how you'd like to split up each hyperparameter space. So this would split uh, negative 10 to 10 uh, four times. And then your chunk size is how many, uh, it's, it's how many uh, evaluations to do before reporting back a result. Uh, it's just kind of like how, how frequently you'll get feedback. And then we call our optimize on the params. Jumping over to random, so I'm using the same example here. Now the only difference is we use the random optimizer and our number, our uh, parameters to the random optimizer are gonna be specific to the random optimizer. So here we specify number of iterations. 
So we're just doing a thousand iterations, uh, randomly sampling these hyperparameters. And then our genetic optimizer um, interface has uh, a lot of different uh, values you can set. The one shown here, you can set your number of generations. Here we're doing 10 generations, population size of 10, and then four deems. A deem is a local population that um, helps you avoid falling into uh, getting all of your population stuck in a local minimum. Um, you can kind of start your deems out in different locations and let them evolve separately, occasionally doing migration between them. <clears throat> um, so this would, this would be evaluating four times 10, 40 uh, individuals per generation. Okay, and then jumping over to a distributed genetic HPO example. Um, so we've switched up our hyperparameters here to something more realistic. Um, and uh, we have a few more, uh, few more arguments exposed here. You can specify your mutation rate, crossover rate, and where you'd like to log your global results. Um, but the key, the key thing to note here is that, um, is that we've just specified our number of nodes, and that's, that's really all we need to do to enable uh, distributed HPO here. You can, uh, if you have a allocation, you can, um, if you have an allocation that you're not running on interactively, you can pass that allocation job ID here as well to run on it. And then multi-distributed genetic HPO, um, uh, so if, you're, if you recall, we support two different types of distribution. So say train.py um, actually is a distributed evaluator or distributed training. Um, so we specified dash dash n equals four, just pretending that that is the um, way to, to run this with four nodes. And then we have to tell the evaluator we're gonna run this with four nodes so that it knows to um, tell the underlying workload manager to run this over four nodes. And so um, with 16 nodes and four nodes per evaluation, we're going to be running four training, uh, four evaluations at a given time. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, so actually just a quick correction. So this script you're looking at here has to be a Python script because it's calling the Cray AI library. But this can be whatever, this is just a black box. This can be whatever you want. So, yeah, yeah, I, I, th I think I understand your question. So that's, it, that is kind of all put onto the user here. So the, it's, it's, it's up to the user how they want to combine, combine either multiple different uh, loss functions, loss values, or, um, or uh, yeah, so th they may have another layer between their train.py and, the, uh, and the evaluator here. Does that make sense? Okay, um, so just showing some data collected with the, um, with the HPO, the Cray AI HPO um, framework. So this is LUNET on MNIST. Uh, so th this, is a, uh, this is a neural network um, primarily trained or optimized for image recognition. And so MNIST is the um, classic hello world in uh, machine learning where you have digits one to 10 that you're trying to identify. <clears throat> and so this is, what, this is what this looks like in, um, in Cray AI HPO. So um, this is actually a particularly big run. We're doing 250 generations with 100 population size, only one deem, so we're not using that feature. Um, so this is actually gonna do quite a few, uh, quite a few evaluations but we're searching a pretty big space here. We're actually searching the, uh, if I go back here, we're searching the topology of, of these um, layers um, specified through these um, arguments here. And we're also searching the momentum and dropout. So, so this is just showing an example of how you can do a topology search in Cray uh, HPO. Um, by uh, exposing these hyperparameters via the command line, command line flags and um, uh, just searching over this integer space. Now it's worth mentioning, um, this, is, this looks clean on this side, but on the user side, they do need to 
basically handle that inside of the uh, inside of their mnist.py. Uh, fortunately, I think this one's relatively simple, but um, there are cases where you have dependencies between hyperparameters. Like say say we also wanted to do um, say we also wanted to do like uh, like a I don't know, say we wanted to do another hyperparameter that depended on say the, uh, this hyperparameter here, we can't do that today in Cray AI HBO, we don't support uh, dependent hyperparameters. Um, there, are a, there are a handful of uh, frameworks out there that do support that though. Okay, just showing some results. Um, so this is the LUNET on, in MNIST um, with the genetic algorithm of uh, applied. So this is with the original um, hyperparameters chosen from the paper, and this is the accuracy they reached. And here's our genetic approach, uh, genetic search, finding the optimal hyperparameters, or, or reaching the accuracy uh, in a much shorter training time after after finding the optimal hyperparameters. Okay, next I'm gonna jump over to Cray population-based training. All right, so Cray's uh, population-based training implementation has a few extensions to DeepMind's original PBT. Um, and that's, uh, if you want more information, this is in the uh, paper linked here. Um, but the main, the main uh, extension is that we, uh, do, we use reproduction with uh, a probabilistic multipoint crossover between three parents instead of two. So we have um, two hyperparameter parents. So there's gonna be two parents chosen that we take hyperparameters from and then a different parent that we take parameters from um, rather, than, rather than just always copying uh, the hyperparameters and parameters from a good parent over to, um, over to a bad, a bad uh, individual. And so the main advantages here uh, that are discussed in the paper are um, this gives you a more rapid adaptation and allows you to, to uh, basically shed bad sets of hyperparameters quick, more, uh, more quickly, um, which is especially helpful for a large number of hyperparameters. Um, so I'm going to show the PBT interface as it is today, but um, as I mentioned earlier, we're in the kind of the alpha phase of Cray HPO, and we are modifying, this is one of the interfaces we are changing, um, kind of doing a, a pretty big, uh, uh, just redesign of the interface. So, um, so the way you enable, the way you enable uh, PBT today is that you still use a genetic optimizer. The underlying algorithm is still a genetic optimizer. However, the, uh, However, we're doing this early stopping um, throughout the genetic optimization. Um, so the key feature, the key way to turn on PBT today is to, to enable a checkpoint file or checkpoint directory. Um, so passing this checkpoint um, argument to the evaluator. And then you also need to specify, you also need to include a checkpoint variable uh, specified by this at symbol in your, uh, command line flags to your, um, to your uh, training kernel. And your training kernel needs to take, this, uh, take these flags, so take these values of, I have a checkpoint directory and a model, and I, I know I need to load from that one, and then take this one and say, I have a checkpoint directory path to another model, I know I need to save to that one. So the, uh, the optimizer framework's gonna be handing these paths to the evaluator, but the evaluator, um, but the training kernel needs to know what to do with them. So it kind of requires some, uh, a little bit of coding on the user inside of their training kernel. Um, so here's just an example with dropout rate and uh, uh, modifying optimizers. Um, yeah, and that's, that's all you need to do to turn on the PBT today. We are going to be moving on to a different interface uh, where we are, we have a standalone PBT optimizer that you use instead. Um, so just to show some data from uh, our PBT implementation. So here's um, ResNet 20 on the CIFAR 10 data set, which is, um, I forget the exact number, but a bunch of 
um, a, a very large data set of images with 10 different classes. Um, yeah, so we're gonna take the ResNet 20 um, original hyperparameters and try to optimize those. So what you can see here is we're, with the PBT, we're discovering an improved training schedule over the original um, learning rate and weight decay. So, um, so this black line here is our weight decay from the original paper and this uh, jagged, let's see here, oh, I'm sorry. This jagged uh, red line is our learning, learning rate as from the original paper. And you can see that PBT, it's, op it's optimizing the hyperparameters as the model is being trained. It, it's finding a different, uh, more optimal uh, learning rate schedule, as well as finding a separate uh, weight decay schedule um, for training our model. And I guess it's not shown here that it's actually better, but the next slide you can see so here is the error of the original uh, ResNet 20 <clears throat> uh, approaching, approaching convergence down here. And then here's with the, uh, with the PBT learning schedule that we found. Um, you can see that we, we dropped much quicker. There is, a, there is a point where they pass, they pass, but this is optimized to find the best accuracy overall. And we uh, do end up improving the error or reducing the error over the original ResNet 20 by 11%. And this is a, um, just to highlight that you can do this in a distributed uh, environment. This is running over 103 nodes. So this is a pretty large, this was a pretty large experiment. Each epoch took around five minutes and we're going out to 300 epochs. Okay, so, um, so to use Cray AI um, today, uh, so on the Cray Eureka platform, if you're a Cray customer, you have, you have uh, Eureka XP 1.2 and CS 1.1 plus, they include Cray AI through, the, uh, through these modules, which modifies your Python path to make it. You can load either module. Uh, this one's included in that one. Um, on NERSC, it's not, yet widely available. It's, uh, we're currently just doing uh, local builds and doing some early testing with, uh, with people at NERSC. And we do want to open source this um, to both uh, just make it a more long-term project, a more community project, as well as allow people to grab the source and go build it on their own local machines um, without having to have some uh, distribution mechanism. That's a good question. <laughs> I don't want to speculate on the fly here, <laughs> but I'm hoping soon. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, that'd be nice. We'll see what happens. Okay, and then I'm just gonna talk about some ongoing work with Cray AI, uh, some of which I've already mentioned. So we wanna continue improving the, uh, the features and stability. Uh, we wanna support more launchers than we do today. I think today we have Slurm, PBS, and then Eureka systems. We wanna support Jupyter integration. So today you can run Cray AI in a Jupyter notebook, but unfortunately, um, like any Python program that calls out to a non-Python uh, program, you have this problem in Jupyter Notebooks where anything written to standard out or standard error from the non-Python program does not get piped forward to the output in Jupyter. Um, so there are some solutions that exist to that that we're looking into. Um, so the result of that is if you do go pick this up and run it in a Jupyter Notebook, it's going to, be, it's going to look like it's totally unresponsive because it's gonna be running your training for a very long time um, and then it'll finish at some point and you'll get, you'll get some output. Um, we want to con continue to implement new strategies. We have Bayesian on the way, and we'd like to implement some of these more modern approaches in recent development. Um, and uh, of course, I would like to open source it. We would like to open source it um, as a team. And um, just to give you a, a bigger picture idea of what we're doing at Cray, um, so this is just one AI workflow component of many that we're planning on developing. 
So uh, Cray also has plans to develop a um, AI workflow um, framework uh, where uh, the hyperparameter optimization will be just one, one stage here. So this is Cray AI HPO. Um, our next target is feature selection, um, which may not be as important in deep learning, but um, we hope that this will be uh, something useful to machine learning workflows in general. Okay, and I'd also, uh, let's see, how are we doing on time before I? Um, I guess I could do a quick demo. Let me jump, let me do a quick, well, okay, let me do my acknowledgements, and before you clap, I'll do a quick demo. Um, so, uh, quick acknowledgements, I'd like to acknowledge some uh, people from the AI team at Cray, Alex Hay, um, Aaron Vos, who was the original author of the uh, Cray PBT, Alessandro, who contributed the Bayesian optimization, um, Benjamin Robbins, my manager, and the Craig Chapel team, who uh, made all of this possible. Um, and then at NERSC, Steve, for, uh, Steve and Prabhat for providing a lot of user feedback. Okay, and I am going to jump over to a quick demo of this live, and then we are going to uh, take questions. All right, so, um, so here's just the quick random example I uh, showed earlier. Um, here we're specifying our seed in our optimizer and we're going to um, optimize this set of parameters. Oh, so this example, this is kind of our hello world example we showed. Um, not because it's anything interesting, but because it shows results quickly because HPO of, of machine learning and deep learning uh, models in general is very time and, uh, takes a lot of time, and so it's nice to do something that evaluates quickly. So here we're just um, we're just creating a um, six-order polynomial and trying to fit that to a sine wave um, in the range of zero to one hundred. Um, so you can see we expose our hyperparameters with um, with uh, arg parse here. These are our polynomial coefficients, and then we print out our figure of merit, which was our um, which was our summed error throughout that uh, fit. Okay, so um, I, I gave it uh, the source, I gave it the command to run that sign.py and here's all of the um, coefficients. Yes, so it's this, this unique identifier which tells the evaluator what to look for. Yes, and that's, uh, that's just the default value. You can specify that over here um, with, I think it's just multiple figures, of merit at the same time. multiple figures of merit at the same time. Oh, I see. Yeah, that's, that's not supported today, but yeah, I, I could see use cases for that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Maybe when we're open source, you can open an issue on our project. Okay, so I'm going to run this random example real quick. Um, so we're just printing out our baseline hyperparameters, um, random search with 100 generations. So I just ran a very short, uh, a very short um, example, um, but we print out the best hyperparameters we found. Um, this was the figure of merit that I evaluated, which was 1.2 times better than the original set of hyperparameters. So not a huge improvement. Um, but at least it did improve. And then it, we're, we printed out the figure of merit and the total set of hyperparameters down here. Um, I'll show one more quick example and then we'll... Um, so here's a genetic, here's a genetic uh, strategy. So same problem, but now we're doing a genetic approach. We're gonna do 10 generations, population size of five, and two deems, so, um, so that's gonna be 10 individuals per generation. And then we're logging our results in the CSV file. So I'm gonna run genetic example. And while that's running, I'll just point out, um, so for each generation, it's printing out the global best, the identifier of the best um, individual and its figure of merit, as well as how well it's done since the beginning. Uh, set of hyperparameters, so this is 1.7 times better. It also shows the a global average 
of um, all of the hyperparameters that were evaluated. So we get, we get this set of hyperparameters listed, um, and then we get some information about the breakdown of the deems. So um, the, you can kind of track your populations, how they're progressing, um, and the best set of hyperparameters per deem. And we get some timing outputs. If you wanna, um, if you're writing some large checkpoint files, it can be important to, um, to track how much time it's taking you to write and read those and see if they become a bottleneck at some point. Um, and then this should be done now. Oh, it's not. Uh, we should, okay. And then we found our best set of hyperparameters. So this one found a 4.9, almost a 5x improvement of, over the original set of hyperparameters. Um, and then lastly, I'll, so you can, it prints out these files. Um, so you can go and print one of these. Um, it's just a big CSV file of a bunch of data on your, um, with all of your hyperparameter values, the fitness, the figure of merit, um, and so on. And there's also a global file with global information on all of the evaluations. Okay, um, that's, that's all I have on hyperparameter optimization today. Thanks for listening.